Um, just a, a quick raise of hands, please. Who knows of Upwork? Oh, good. Okay. Branding's working. Odesk? All right, even more Elance. Okay, so I think between all of you, everyone knows what we do. So I can spend one minute just talking about it. Um, but we, recently, we actually rebranded um, to Upwork, and actually this is this, our global team. So we're, we're, we're pretty large. We're actually the largest freelancer market um, globally. Um, I'm here to promote them. As Jonathan's mentioned as well, you, you, you all here to learn more and, and how to develop apps and websites. If you need someone, obviously you can get someone through our platform. I'm doing a startup myself, who isn't? Uh, so I found the developer through Odesk. Uh, got someone to do some web development for me. I actually pay someone a very small amount of money every week to do some social media for me as well. So it's a great platform. You know, if you're trying to start up and you're trying to just get a few things done, um, it's a great platform to hire people. So these are some of the example uh, types of role that you can um, recruit someone for. Um, the most popular by far are web and mobile developers, it goes without saying. But you can use it for designers and creatives, for writers, um, and for even sales and marketing. You can do some People are based all over the world. Um, it's not necessarily going to be some you know, developer based in India, or um, you might get someone in America or in Eastern Europe as well. Um, so there's a whole, ra whole range of different experts that you can rely on. So it's a really simple platform. You, know, you just post a job, it takes about two minutes. Um, you get people applying for roles, and we actually limit that, so you don't get hundreds of people. You only get about 10 or 20 responses, and those people will have ratings, they'll have feedback, they'll have the amount they charge per hour, um, and then their previous experience as well. So it's all very, very useful stuff. Um, and and as, um, as Jonathan mentioned, we will give you $50 towards your first hire. So if you want to um, use our platform, let's say you want to get someone to do some website development for you, um, you know, you could literally spend almost half of that off. So I actually got my website done for about $100, yeah, and a very nice WordPress platform, which I'm quite proud of. So I'm sure that all of you can do it as well. Um, and you know, our platform can enable you to do that. So that's it really. Um, nice, brief and short. Any questions, let me know. I do have some cards to give you that $50 off, and we're going to ping an email at the end of uh, tomorrow. Uh, a few days' time. In a few days' time, when, you get, when Jonathan gets around to it. Um, otherwise, see me after the event, and I can give you a card. So, hi, my name is Alfred Aguirre. Um, I am founder of Make Bytes. My company specializes in uh, uh, web development. What I do, I help small and large companies to build from an MVP to prove that the idea works or it doesn't, to make sure that uh, a large-scale application works uh, for any amount of profit that you can do it. Uh, in the details, um, we are a Python, mostly a specialized company, but we do about everything we do. That's all great. Leon. Um, hi, uh, my name is Leon. I'm a founder at Hive. We create products and services for big corporates. Uh, we work uh, both with Google and Microsoft, we make clients, and we work with startups as well. Uh, we take products from strategy, finding that and understanding who the customer is, what the problem is, uh, all the way through the entire product lifecycle, and then giving back to the corporates. So, uh, allowing them to disrupt in a way a startup. Lucas. Hi, I'm uh, Lucas. I'm, uh, I've been very passionate about kind of technology and web development since I was 15, and uh, then started freelancing, doing web development in university. And now I'm working on a startup called Fashion Link, where we take um, we help fashion brands analyze their sales information. Great. Um, thanks, guys. Um, there's loads of questions from people who submitted them. <coughs> Related to app development, not so much web development, so that's what I guess we'll talk about most. But the first question is mine would be if you're starting off with a basic website trying to launch an MVP, a minimum viable product, um, what would be your main advice to people about how to, to go about that, whether you're doing it yourself or with some assistance? What, what technology should you, 
should you use or be looking at to work with? So, my advice would be to first find exactly what you want to do. Because sometimes that's the most difficult part. Like, uh, mm -hmm. the amount of times that someone says, that, hey, I got an oh. idea that needs to do this and that, it's all of it. So, you need to make sure that you know exactly what you want to do. Um, Everyone. Now that you have an idea, the first thing that you want to do is to make sure that it uh, works or it doesn't, so you can teach it, uh, speak up the next thing. So um, my preferred stack to bootstrapping is using Heroku. It could be Node, it could be Python, it could be whatever you want, but uh, Heroku helps you a lot. Uh, at least on the on the backend side, like you still have. The problem is you're building an app for a mobile, you still need the IO developer and stuff, so most of that's uh, development API driven. So you need to make sure that the API is able to handle the traffic you send to it. And uh, the cost that uh, it's easy to scale with Heroku, and the cost is not as much as you would have to pay an engineer to have to configure the service in AWS. Um, Great. Um, I would say try to get away with testing as much as you can without actually writing any code. <coughs> so really, really ask yourself how can you validate your assumptions without creating anything technical. How much can you get away with that? And when you reach a certain point where you actually need to uh, bring technology into the play, uh, if you're not technical, have a technical co-founder. And use open source as much as you can and upload everything you can to a service provider. So somebody who can do something in the cloud at this point would be probably much better than uh, trying to do it yourself. Um, I, think, I think that's it. And uh, I think when, when people think about MVPs, there's always, uh, you want to get it out as quick as possible. I think, um, especially if you're at the very beginning, you still want to prove you still have ideas about your, your product that you might not be 100% sure about and there's nothing better to tell you which direction to go by users using it and even if it doesn't scale to a thousand people using it simultaneously you'll find out by just the first hundred or the first ten even using it uh, in which direction you want to go. Okay, um, I'll sort of run through the questions that I took from everyone uh, who submitted them and then we'll kind of uh, answer sort of halfway through the hour, then we'll open up to the, the audience. So, um, I don't know if Julio, is Julio here? I'll sort of pick up his question, but um, uh, his question is, what are, what are the factors to bear in mind when uh, choosing to either design an app as opposed to a mobile website or a mobile responsive website? What, what, um, what sort of what are the reasons behind that decision? Is the only thing you can probably know how to make that choice? Any other questions, comments? So, uh, one, one, so it depends on what are you going to be targeting. My preference is mostly web apps, and you can do it like on the web because everyone can access with a device and you can go with responses. But sometimes it's not. Possible, if you need to access uh, or, or, or your application is more interactive. Like if it, it needs like the camera or it needs the, sometimes the location. So that's when another possible need yeah. um, At Hive, we, tr we, we have the opportunity to try a lot of different stacks for uh, different customers. So we played with a lot of different technology. Um, and we went through the web apps and we tried the kind of the write one, deploy everywhere, and all sorts of different uh, t technologies. And our, I would say our philosophy at the moment is that um, it's about your feature list and it's about your uh, product strategy. So how important is mobile for your uh, product strategy? Is your product predominantly mobile? Is it just an addition to your product? Um, and then depending on that and the feature list, you should choose uh, how to develop it. So at the moment, from our experience, uh, if you want a really slick, polished, high-end um, experience of mobile, it's very important for you that the product is mobile-first product, and the goal is native. 
and, and I would invest in that and I would polish it. And if it's a bit more secondary and if you have not a lot of features, that are quite complex or process intensive, I would use a uh, mobile. So it really is about like how complex the product is and how much of a core proposition it is for your actual business model. Uh, if you look kind of historically on uh, um, big companies, they all moved into having a very polished, a very definitive uh, product on mobile uh, because this is what users expect. Uh, the users are very savvy, they know how a good product looks and how a good product behaves and at the moment uh, on the web is just not there, you just can't get the same level of polish or it's very hard, like the, the only thing that I know that is kind of pulling it, it off well is Slack like Slack, I have no idea how they're doing it, but they're doing it quite well across all platforms but that's an exception, that's definitely not the rule. I think, um, definitely think about your product, if, if you do have users that will want to use it both on, on the web, on their computer, and on their mobile phone, uh, if, that, if that's an important thing, especially sometimes in e-commerce. Uh, I think some recent statistics found out that people like to actually look for items on their phone, but then, if especially higher priced items, they do like to complete the purchase on, on, their, on their desktop computers, uh, where they can have a closer look at the item and also feel potentially safer putting in credit card details. I was going to ask that if you guys have any examples of products that are better off on the web as opposed to mobile, or all of that at the moment, like where people buy on the web, and very rarely on mobile. Um, I think there's loads of products that have great web experience on the desktop, and that their dominant kind of uh, use case, they know that a lot of people are going to buy on the desktop, they know that the product has been consumed on the desktop, and this is where we concentrate. Um, I don't know, I'm talking about that. I don't know. There's loads. <laughs> just don't think that's something. Good car or something. I'm just trying to think what I use, and it's there. Uh, I don't know, like I use Zero, for instance, Zero.com for our accounting, and they definitely make a bet that it's a. Most of the people do accounting on the desktop, the product feature list on the desktop, they have a very limited mobile version, and you can see the money and the product as a resource going into the desktop, probably because. Most people do account for that stuff. What do you guys do? Um, I, uh, uh, Bebop, for example. I'm not sure if you guys know Bebop. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's entirely mobile, and it's a bit like Instagram meets eBay. So there's uh, pretty much users take pictures of products, put it in the phone, and then people just can go and buy the top of pics, and then you can pay with credit card or you can pay with PayPal. Oh my god. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, definitely, if you're thinking about e-commerce, mobile traffic is rising a lot. And um, for, for example, Zalando is uh, one of the biggest <coughs> German e-commerce players. And they uh, they get most of their traffic on, the, on their mobile website. And then they try to suggest after the purchase has been completed to download the app. And then the power users, the ones that are very passionate about the brand, will actually download the app and the other people are comfortable to either use the, the mobile website or the desktop website. Um, I think Steph, you say Steph Hassan. Yeah, your, your question is Apple. I don't know if you guys have got any idea about all the, all the apps that are out there. Um, how many or what percentage would you have are actually successful? Um, Very small. It's, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's uh, like a, uh, yeah. I think that when the apps were launched, there was like this gold rush of <coughs> indie devs making money, but I think at the moment it's a small amount of big corporate players and one offs. And, <laughs> like, uh, that's the third thing. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. It's a but otherwise, it's more existing brands converting. I think it's big, big companies that are very smart to do. It's not like a guy in the bedroom creating an app. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's people. If you have a web version of it, I think there's a lot of stats about this one. Mm. Cool. Okay, well, um, there's a couple of questions from people about. Um, 
what they should be looking for when they're hiring a, a freelance developer, um, both in respect of you know, mobile or, uh, apps or, or web. But um, I don't know if you guys have got some sort of perhaps non biased uh, views on uh, who, who, who you should, you know, what are the factors you should look for when, when hiring somebody, um, particularly a freelance person, other than go to Upwork. So, um, it, so I would try to ask how, like how the person would go on about solving a specific problem. Because if you have already the need for a freelancer, chances are that you have a specific set of problems that you have. So instead of trying to assess the quality of the individual by doing like, hey, we're going to need some uh, coding test or something. Sometimes just having a talk about how would you go on about solving this problem would be the right way to do it. Of course, like, you should try to get someone technical as well to assist you in choosing the right person. But that, it, it's always a risk. Like, there's no, like, in, like sometimes to, to actually uh, get to know if someone is technically capable can take like a month or so before you can realize. So it's it's difficult in an hour, 20 minutes to try to assess the capabilities. But uh, I found that as it's a, it's a good indicator when someone knows what they are talking about, but they definitely it's not the right person for a yeah. um, It's very hard. I'm just trying to think like for a non-technical person to hire a technical person is very hard. Um, like. Well, I'm a technical person and I find it hard. So for me the best indication would be to look at the person's code. If you don't know how to look at code, uh, you're pretty blind. Like for instance, I went to a, clean my teeth today and I have no idea if she did a good job. Like I was thinking about how do I know if she did a good job? I have no idea. So it's the same thing. If you don't know anything about technology, you're you're pretty much firing uh, in in you know blindly. But I would say that and a good indicator would be to maybe have a look at what they do on in their spare time and how much they contribute back to community. Uh, so for instance, asking for a GitHub account and a Stack Overflow account will give you a very quick kind of overview of a person. So you can go to GitHub account, to their GitHub account and see how much private repositories they have. So there's forks, so it's it's kind of confusing because you have Fork. So, for instance, I could fork, I could fork Node, and I could never do anything on the code base, but it still look as if I have a repository. So ignore those. <laughs> what's, what's, that, what's that fork? Uh, so fork is like fork in a code. Uh, I don't know. Okay, so uh, uh, so this, this, there's this, a little fork. Ignore those. <laughs> uh, and and look at the rest. So if he has, if he maintains a lot of repositories, you can see as well. Uh, yeah, take the time from here for me familiarize yourselves with GitHub. If you're hiring a technical yeah. person, take time to learn about GitHub. GitHub. Yeah. Who knows GitHub? What's what's it? Okay. <coughs> what is it called? GitHub. G I T H U. Yeah. Yeah. So take time to learn about it. So a lot of people seem to know GitHub. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. But can you uh, one of you give an overview of what GitHub is for the uninitiated? Yes. Yeah, so GitHub is basically a way of working together on projects that involve code, and it's, it's based around repositories, which is the central code base, and then anybody can send their changes and their code to this central repository, which can be viewed by other people. So it's a very good way of managing code on projects, but you can also work on open source projects, uh, and anybody can contribute or try to contribute to, to an open source project. And like you say, people contribute to open source projects and shows that they're really into the, into the code and into the language. Yeah, so most people will have their own repo, they will commit quite often. So some people have repos and they're like committed in 2012. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, that's a really good indicator, quite easy. Stack Overflow as well, How, what's his score on Stack Overflow? Has he been uh, answering other people's questions, or is he usually asking the questions? That's kind of quite a simple tool, I think maybe we have a look. It's one of the first things I look when I hire somebody before I... One more thing when you're when you're hiring someone, I think probably goes back to the previous question as well. Do you, do you want an app, or do you want a website, do you want a web app? Um, and then look at kind of comparative projects.
things that this person has already done, and if they could develop kind of the back end to the app as well, do you need to hire someone else to handle the back end when you have a pure app developer and those kind of things? Great. Um, well, that's a specific question about um, apps and payment systems here from David Sandor, if David's here, but um, he just wants to know what your <coughs> viewer are is on the leading in-app payment gateways to use for micropayments. Um, um, if you do anything that is not a real-world object, you have to go through Apple. So if you're not selling stuff that is in the real world, you have to use Apple Pay, like Apple Payment System, uh, through the App Store. Uh, so if it's any kind of digital good. So if you have um, a subscription business model, for instance, and you don't have a desktop equivalent for your app, all the payments going through the app are going to be taxed by Apple. So you could have a solution where you have a desktop app, and then you sell the service there, collect the money, and then a person can use it on the app as well. I don't know if I'm explaining that properly. Um, so I think that is one of the first things that people don't realize really when they think about collecting money on mobile. Um, using Apple is the most straightforward way, I would say. Uh, what about with Android? On Android, I don't have a lot of experience on Android. Okay. Yeah, do you recommend developing Android apps or do you always? Um, so, like, I think that from, like, when we do stuff for clients, we say that um, the early adopters and kind of people that pay for stuff on mobile are on iOS. Uh, there's a lot of research there that says that people on Android actually use it as a phone, which is weird. <laughs> spend a lot of money on Android yeah, exactly, they don't buy stuff they will not give you money um, so if you manage to collect money on iOS then that's, you know, that's awesome and then you can consider if you should go into Android as well, I think jumping into two together is a bit dangerous especially for, like I, I can I imagine that uh, uh, entrepreneur type uh, kind of early stage business to concentrate on one platform. Even if I was concentrated on a platform, I would do that on iOS. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, another sort of technical question is um, uh, you know, from John Harris, I think might be here. Um, is what are the best ways to improve the speed and reduce latency for web apps? Um, cool. That's a very specific question. So. Uh, so it, 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 if you haven't like you're probably thinking of a specific implementation, so it could have to do with the way that the application is architecture. Uh, it, it try to cache as much as you can. Like you could, uh, there there uh, there are things that you can put in front of your application that will respond really fast. Uh, uh, public API calls that you will see all the time and that the least that you hit your actual application that processes the API call the better. But it again it, it depends on your application. It could be that it, uh, each user has a session and you are not able to cache uh, that much. Yeah? yeah I think on another note there's um, a difference to be made between speed and perceived speed as well. So just something as simple as uh, making sure there's a placeholder for, for all the images and then fit, fading them in um, quickly when they've loaded can improve the user experience instead of having, having empty boxes um, that, that, that will kind of show you that they have to wait. So <coughs> making sure it can be used and it doesn't stall while everything is loading as opposed to yeah, just progressively loading everything as needed. Um, yeah, it's a very general question about whether it's you know, web or app development, but what are your, um, what do you see as the fundamentals of design and user experience that people should bear in mind, or what are your, your sort of bugbears or your key points that you always try to put across to people? 
I guess it would depend on the product and the service, but very generally. So I think there, there are different approaches to this. I'm uh, progressing and having a um, person for the web apps. Uh, I strongly believe that the core of your application should work without uh, JavaScript enable. So it should be like a really simple flow and then try to enhance from that. Because uh, sometimes JavaScript can make your application very fragile. So there's a point when you have a, a JavaScript error, it might not work for the user, and then you pretty much the user lose the whole experience. But I'm sure that's how the user is. So is it for usability and mobile specifically? Either, yeah. Or web. Either web or whatever. Yeah, whatever. Um, yeah I, I think that the most important thing for us is this, we always think about our users first of everything else. Um, we think about customers and what they want more than anything else. And I, it's a very simple rule, but it's so hard to implement in the end. Um, so if you constantly <coughs> concentrate on your customers first beyond anything else and how they um, use your product, then you will build a good product. Definitely. I mean, when you, when you think, uh, ask yourself why, and I think sometimes we, we don't we don't do this, and um, we can say, is this going to be useful for the user, or are we implementing something for the sake of technology or for the for another reason, and does the user benefit from this feature, this design element, <coughs> this button? Does it need to read? <laughs> um, okay, so going back to the kind of touch of before, but going back to right to the beginning when somebody's got a, an idea and they want to work with um, a developer on something, what, um, what's the what's the sort of sequence of a actions? What should they be doing to sort of um, set things out, make things you know, so to actually sort of communicate their, their ideas to, uh, I guess, a technical person who's going to bring this idea to life? So, as, uh, as a developer, I think that user journeys are the best uh, way to uh, shape the application. You, you can define how the user is going to start interacting and what's going to be the output from it. And then from there you can generate as many as you want, and then from that you can in, infer what's the core of the application and how it should behave. Um, so I like I, a lot of times I meet um, non-technical entrepreneurs, and my um, main piece of advice will always be, and sometimes it seems very hard to accept that, I think, is that if you're building a technical product and your business is technology, you need to have a technical co-founder. Find somebody who's amazing at technology and give him fifty percent of your company. He has. Like technical people don't need you, it's the other way around when it comes to building technology business. And sometimes it's hard to accept that. But um, if you have a person who is as um, involved in the business as you are, uh, and he holds half of the company and he does the technology, you, most of, like your chances of building an amazing product are so much higher. So if you don't know technology, get somebody who has and treat them with the respect that they deserve because they're going to be doing a lot of work. And I think um, ex expect delays as well. Yes. I think, yes. I think, yeah. I think um, it's, uh, put a lot of trust in this person and responsibility, but um, <coughs> things try to work out. Yeah. yeah. It's easy to say. Um, okay. I might as well open up to the audience. So it's enough of you out there. I hope you've got those pressing questions. But um, is anyone who wants to raise their hand? To uh, ask these guys anything. Um, yeah. Um, would, uh, would a custom design on iOS uh, drastically affect the performance, or it does not necessarily affect it? If you're doing like something that's not completely native. Native app or not native? A native app. Um, anything you do custom on the native is going to take longer and cost more money. So if you use um, out of the box, iOS as a development platform gives you a lot. 
uh, iOS 7 or previous versions as well, they give you a whole UI element that you can reuse and all that. Sticking to that is going to be a lot faster, a lot uh, less expensive. Everything that is bespoke is on top. So if you are building an MVP, for instance, try and make it as less bespoke as you can. I don't know what the product is, but if you can get away with using standard components, uh, use those. Uh, it's, it's a big difference. But speed-wise, speed does speed in response to There's no, no difference in speed. It doesn't matter. Speed of development, not speed in response. Yes. When people talk about hybrid over native for mobile apps, what does that mean for someone like me? Who doesn't understand. So, like, yeah, people said that, um, hybrid over native for mobile apps. Something that thing. Yeah, I, like from our experience, um, like we've been delivering a lot of different products, and hybrid never works. So we always deliver the right technology for the right platform. The uh, we tried a lot of times, a lot of points different tools that promised us to write code once and deliver to Android and iOS and to web and all at the same time. It's going to be amazing. And here it goes, and this is the one. Uh, it's not. We always uh, regretted that. And at the moment, we always do native, and we always deliver the right knowledge for the right problem. It might change in the future, but at the moment, that's the, our position. Cool. So I'm just in the front right hand. Yeah, that, that was my question. All right. <laughs> Um, but it was kind of related. Is React JS the thing that makes it scroll nicely on a mobile, but then when you have it on the desktop, you have websites that just scroll and scroll and scroll, and it's like a weird experience? Or is that something else that does that? Um, yeah. this, this is kind of, it's only in the last few years I keep coming across websites that clearly weren't really meant to be websites, they're meant to be scrolled all the way down, they don't have proper menus around the sides like proper websites do. It, 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 this is interesting because um, it, it depends on what the intent of the designer and the developer was on it. But I'm, I'm not sure if you're referring to, to, to the user experience that you're getting from the yeah. app that's not quite right, or is it like business? No, it's in, just in the last few years, there are websites that didn't exist prior to the last few years that the content is all laid out as one big long scrolly thing, like no Street. menus around. Yeah, yeah. Oh, right. and it, it, it's as if it's like designed for mobile first, and that's just what you end up with. Kind of like Pinterest. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> but, yeah. So, so another bit. So this is. Um, it is a bit like fashion sometimes, the <laughs> design you can see. Like, everyone got on board with the parallax, and then you can see parallax like a hundred, the best hundred parallax site on the internet, whatever. Uh, right now, the, I think the main uh, worry about developers is that there are many screens everywhere. Everything can be connected to the internet now. So you don't know where your brother is going to be rendered. So that's where they go for the single. Uh, uh, column or single layer with the menus because that way you can be safe that's going to be rendered somewhere. Like if you start having the three columns, how is it going to fit on the most three or is it going to be a four grade landscape? I don't know. So that's, that's basically the reason now. That might change in the future. Very good question. Mm -hmm. and, um, so I go up here and I see the hand right here in the third row. Thank you. Um, I got interested in, in what you said, Leon, about uh, testing an MVP as much as you can without coding. And I was curious if you would have some examples. Um, sure. So in Hive, we use um, a lot of different techniques to test uh, assumptions we make about products. Uh, so we that involves talking to people. Like, the most simple thing is talking to people and asking them, what they think about different solutions. Uh, prototyping, so kind of creating prototypes in Keynote, in like there's so many tools at the moment. You can create an app that like almost looks real to a person that doesn't really know much about uh, development. And if you, you haven't written a single line of code. So 
video could be like, have you read the Lean Startup? Very no. big. So in, in the Lean Startup, which is a book that informs a lot of our work, there's uh, descriptions of different techniques that you can use to uh, validate ideas without writing any code. Mm -hmm. uh, like video prototyping, uh, guerrilla prototyping, just drawing some interfaces going out out of the building, talking to people and asking them. And I think people don't do that enough to kind of jump into a solution. Mm -hmm. So, does that answer the question? Yes. Yes, thank you. Great, thank you. Great, thanks. Um, yeah. Do you have any differences in relationship to <coughs> corporate into the relationship you clients have with stuff? Um, what is, so the question is, what is the difference the relationship? in the relationship? Um, the... <coughs> more involved in the other, you know, different rate, that's mm -hmm. maybe introduced, that picture a bit more interested in one than the other? Is it the tech behind it, what they're doing, is it people? So we get hired for the same purpose, we uh, help execute the product. Um, and the main difference I think is that the corporate environment, they a lot of times want to work in the way that a startup founder would. So you are somewhere in a decision mechanism in Microsoft or Google, and you're in charge of a product, and you want to do this stuff, but you can't. So we need to have another um, kind of part of the work is how to explain and how to move things through corporate processes. So we have experience of how to take really cutting edge methodologies and pass them through corporate kind of barriers. You know? So I, I don't know if you've worked in any company before, there is uh, a lot of stuff that is done that has nothing to do with work. So passing stuff, passing things. Every day. Every day. Yeah, exactly. We, we, we are all about work. So we are about creating amazing products. And with corporates, we need to... So that's a restriction then. Sorry. It's not because a restriction. It's, it's just another thing you have to jump over. And we understand how to do that. But it's an extra work that I don't need to do with the founder. Right. Okay. Do you prefer working with startups? Uh, I think so, yeah. Um, with, with founders, sometimes you need to educate. But then it's kind of, you know, you find the right people that are willing to listen. So there's people that are willing to listen and they want to be educated, and people that are not. So it's kind of like choosing ground. Kind of follow up, thank you. As a development house, do you have more opportunities to um, partner with startups uh, from an equity base? Sorry, say again. Do you have more opportunities to partner for the down on an equity base? So more opportunities than. Or would, would you decide to sort of, uh, rather than paying you purely in, in fees, take that to the start? So, cool. Uh, so, in high, we have like a hot seat for a company. Uh, so, we bring a company and we uh, have an equity cash deal. Uh, they need to have a significant amount of funding. And we create a kind of an equity and a cash deal, so we take equity directly into the company, mm. and we nurture them and we execute on their behalf and then help them to. Um, That's quite a mature start if anything very young. Um, the thing is that the person that is the founder has to have certain skills, and uh, a lot of the skills that a founder needs at this point is being able to raise money. Uh, so when somebody raised money, he kind of he has the skills to convince people about their idea and push it forward. Uh, we can supplement a lot of other stuff. Um, yeah, on the Hi. When you build a product and launch it, and it might be doing reasonably well, what are the next steps for improving the product beyond just more features or maybe less features? Um, what are the steps in terms of the data you want to collect and your ongoing work that So that's why they're keeping me looking at once you sort of started something. So um afraid of you. Cool. So um I think you should start taking that everything. You need to see how people are using your app, how what what people is actually using, maybe discard the stuff that people are using and try it. From that to expand more features. Like, I do not advise to uh, just add more features just to see what people do. Like, try to get like a direction where you want to go, take metrics on it, and uh, start implementing new features.
here so you can move towards that direction. It's, it's, it's easy to uh, fall in, uh, to fall into feature creep. You say like, yeah, this is going to be awesome, this is going to be awesome. Then you are like a lot, long pile of things that need to be done, and then the app is like very broad, and it's like, oh, I'm not sure what we're really doing. So just sort of be very careful what you focus on. Yeah. Just pick one, one thing at a time. One thing at a time with that direction. Mm -hmm. Definitely, I think um, try to record as much uh, of your users' kind of actions as possible so that you can see what, what is working and what isn't, and then have the right questions to ask with the right. Um, I mean, this is all since it's data driven, since you know you can say uh, we need at least 70% of the users to be using this function for us to make it valuable to keep, to keep or to expand on. And if uh, less than 20% of users use this function, then we have to discard it. And uh, I think it's knowing exactly which questions you want to ask and exactly what the results are that are going to influence your decision because you can easily monitor everything. And but if you haven't actually made any kind of efforts beforehand to plan what you want to do with that data, there's, you can look at so many things without really doing anything with it. Um, yeah, uh, my question is, as, as a business manager, I want a lower cost, so I want a, a web app, but um, I also want the sort of functions of uh, reminders and push notifications. So any ideas? Uh, can I get reminders and push notifications with a web app? Uh, if you want to get them as you can get with other apps, no, you will have to go to mobile. Like the, the, the alternative for the web app is mostly, oh, I have to send you an email or an SMS or something like that. So it, the, the, the experience for that might not be as nice, but if you want to go with a web app that does that, then it's broad, you can go on, on a desk or, or it's, it not, you don't depend on only phone. But, but again, like if you want like fancy notifications you would normally get, you would need to have a, you have to do with an app. So just a follow-up question on that. The hybrid app. So is the role here for the hybrid of using the native app, so a simple native app, which will then accept the reminders and the push notifications, and then that call a web app, which you know which does more of the specific. Can you link the two in that way? Yeah, yeah, definitely. You can have, like, I, I, I know that there are apps that they used to act like a wrap. Like, you have to install the app, you get all the native stuff, but most of what you're seeing is just an HTML rendering and server, and just being pulling up, pulling your phone. Um, take another question, then, the guy the, the jacket, yeah. Hi there. Um, with, um, Revenue as subscription based revenue models. What would you say are your key factors to retain, retaining your users and retaining those subscriptions? Subscription models, key factors to retain users. Make them happy? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But other so. than that, if there's anything that's as a key factor that's going to continue them to stay. So once they've done, once they're using it. Yeah, once they're subscribed member, maybe for six months or something. So um, like stickiness or something? Yeah. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah. Um, any, any examples of products you've got and things yeah. that work? Um, so I think stickiness is hard. Um, there's a book that came out just recently, how to build uh, something, like how to build addictive products, something along those lines. Um, there, <laughs> I think it has to be, if stickiness is important, it has to be like a core for your product definition for your, you know, like, um, if you think about stuff that is on your phone that you look at constantly, they're, you know, they're really, that is a massive part of their product, they really tweak that. Um, I don't think that there is like a <coughs> magical answer, you have to, you have to uh, create a product that is sticky and it's hard. Um, I don't know like, what sort of product you're interested in building, but there is no magical... Like a push notification, for instance, we discussed that, is not going to make a product sticky. 
just going to annoy somebody. Mm -hmm. So if you say, come and have a look at you, the app you haven't looked at it for two days, you're probably going to uninstall it. Uh, so it has to be just a really deep part of the product. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there, there are certain ways of, I mean, making sure that the value is, is retained to the user um, from the same value that they're getting on, on the first day when they sign up, uh, six months later. What, why are they still using the app six months later? And is there a reason for them to still be paying the fees? If there's no reason for them, then there's probably no reason to, to keep paying them because they forget or you know, don't want to go to the effort of unsubscribing. Um, then there's obviously kind of lock-in models. Um, I think Dropbox, if you have 100 or a terabyte of your, of your data um, in their cloud, it's going to be very hard for you to, to move it all over to, to Google Drive if you want it to change. But then it's not impossible, so. Yeah, this also taps as well into the metrics. Like, you, if you have a better product, you want to see how it's performing. So you should already be taking metrics on how much, how, how how any changes are affecting the sign-ups that you're getting or the retention that you're getting and then test on it, is it work, is it work, and try to vary it. Like sometimes your morning screen might like, work Okay, anyone else? Yeah. Sure. I went to a bit of advice or kind of pointers around contracting between kind of entrepreneurs and development companies. Especially given the fact that throughout development there's likely to be changes or issues or anything like that, and how we should go about structuring a contract or thinking about what you will do for a contract or whether a contract is worthwhile, etc. Um, yeah, I, I guess contracts are always good, but then there's the amount of time that they take to put in place as well. So if you're a startup, you just you don't want to spend time necessarily on a to put the value of the project in. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess well, there's, there's the, the Agile contract, which I, Leon probably knows more than I do, even though I work on them. But there's very specific ways of working and procedures that I guess enhances communication or makes sure that everyone's on the, on the same page with how, how the development process works. Um, and there's a structure there, and um, people have to find roles and responsibilities, and um, and, uh, and how you know how meetings are called, and how different phases will work on a on a step by step basis, even though you can't necessarily foresee what the exact stages of development will be. Um, yeah, I don't know if you've got you know, you've got anything to add. I guess you started from having. Uh, more basic contracts, yeah. sort of getting bogged down in uh, larger ones with a particular the bigger corporates. Yeah, I think like, contracting is, um, like I think the law profession is catching up with where the industry is. Um, I think that, I, I would say that my main advice is to accept the fact that change is inherited to developing software. So software changes all the time. As you develop the software, you will discover that things need to change, and you can't fight change. You're never going to win. Uh, so, development practices, design practices, uh, product practices are trying to cope with that, and different methodologies come up to deal with change and accept it and embrace it and uh, fight against it. So, I would, my advice would be with your situation with whoever you work with, you try and set up a framework where you accept change and you embrace the fact that things might take longer than they expected, or they not, might change as you discover what you need for your product. So it's kind of in, in both ways. Um, yeah. how, how, do you, how, how do you find working with a sort of agile methodology or using contracts that are more focused on dealing specifically with that rather than so we try, what we, the work we did with Jonathan is to try to create a, a contractual framework where um, we don't talk about the, about the what, but we talk about the how. So it's not so much about what we're building and defining features and putting them in contract. It's more about what are the processes that we would use to develop software, um, which is kind of where the agile movement um, is inspired us, is how can we create processes. 
they're about embracing change and we try to bring that into a contractual framework. It's very open <coughs> in the, uh, compared to other contracts, it's a very open framework. Um, more about how things are done, less about uh, exactly what is uh, done. We're actually looking to maybe open source so we're kind of in talks with Jonathan as well. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, oh, yeah. so uh, maybe just open source put it on Git. So I think you look at um, yeah. um, so, if your uh, business is uh, service-based uh, and you're planning to roll it out in multiple cities or countries, uh, how should you face the launch? What is what is the average time expected, keeping in mind, obviously, web and app development? Good products. 
prominence, but um, I, as myself, as a user, if I have a, uh, a web app, and I immediately notice it. Like it's not, it's just not as nice. And I really enjoy this little experience on my phone because it's something that is quite brief. It's, you know, I expect a good experience. And in terms of, from our experience, um, the promise was that if we are willing to uh, let go of that, then the promise is, is that we'll have to write less code and we'll have to debug less. And we found out that it just didn't work out like that, that you actually still had to write a lot of code and you still have to worry about all the different platforms and it's just the, the trade-off was not worth it. That's, that's our experience. What do you guys say about so that? You, I, I think I disagree with that it's not possible to have a big experience but there are so many things that you need to consider while you're designing and uh, in order to get like a slick experience and you will get it naked you will need an expert in front end development because you start to get into the layout, redrawing of objects that are being marked up so it, it, is a lot of, it requires a lot of in-depth knowledge on what the engine that you're using to render the uh, HTML and CSS and JavaScript is doing in the back. So it might be easier just to do it native just for the sake of... Um, it, it's always a trade-off, you know, it has its process. It's like if you go hybrid, that means that you already have a rendering the HTML blocks and you might be able to do it, I don't know, for Android or something. I don't really have a strong opinion on on HTML5 web app in the, in the container or, or native app, I'm sure like native apps are a lot slicker, I think, um, in their emotions. But then I think as startups, we we have to think about what, what's viable. And it's, um, I think if we can develop something very quickly on the web, get it out there uh, in an app as well. And if it's a responsive web app, then you, you've already got like three potential um, places where, where you can use it. And um, you know, that would be a very, very quick thing to do when you're in a, in a very early stage. And then once you have you know, your Series A, you can definitely invest in your know, dedicated app. Yeah, I completely agree with that. Like, it depends how important mobile is for a product. If it's core, and then you should invest in that. If mobile is not core, and you need to move fast. Like, developing on the web is faster for simple things, not for you know? Also, you are not, you don't depend on uh, the Apple Store for real releases. Go along, go pretty fast. And the final question then, um, yeah, um, yeah, I just wanted to ask, um, when it comes to um, sizable projects, for example, um, uh, do you think it would be better if, say, you're working with a, a freelancer or some, you know, someone like that, if, uh, you know, you just get one freelancer and, you know, give them the whole project, you know, the, all the work, or if uh, maybe it's better to find, you know, several different freelancers and, you know, just give them a piece of the project each, and, you know, if it's the latter, um, how do you divide you know, the, the project to, to do that? So, um, it will depend on the budget as well. Like, bringing more people in as well increases the expenses. Um, and it's difficult to find someone that's an expert on everything on the field. Then, most of the time, you find that, okay, for the back inside, I'm going to need a guy from the front end, I'm going to need another guy from the iOS or Android, I'm going to need another guy. Just getting a single person to do three jobs, you might stretch the person a bit too much, and the quality of the product that you're creating might not be great. Like maybe if you are trying just to test the idea, if it works, that would be fine, but if you're trying to deliver a Polish product, it might be it might not be a good idea to get a single person to do all of your You might stretch it too much. They're trying to keep everything in their head, like momentum or something. Yeah. What about the importance of that? Um, I would say that if you need to manage it technically or project manage it, and you ask in this question, you're probably not uh, set up to do that. So I, I would think that if, if you need to coordinate stuff, <coughs> You, com you have the complexity to help us. I, I would consider taking like a development company to do that uh, because they will have more experience, they will have people in house. And, um, yeah, it's, I think it's a better bet than trying to 
not being technical and trying to technically manage several developers that coordinate with them. I would say, yeah, that probably consider taking a company that has sets of skills that you need. Okay, well, I'm going to wrap it up there because it's gone past eight. Thanks to these guys for um, sharing their wisdom.